<laughs> Here, I can let me pray, guys. I'll bring the, the mic down. Oh no, it'll capture up here as well. Feel free to fill in the seats up front and how they say front and center. So for others who may come. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Community Book Center is honored 
to present this program to you this afternoon. We have been waiting for quite some time to host an event where best-selling author Kwame, Kwame Alexander Kwame is a poet, an educator, and a storyteller. He's published over 36 books. He's won numerous awards. Newberry, New York Times bestseller, Lee Bennett Hops Hopkins Poetry Award, Coretta Scott King Honor, the NAACP Image Awards, just to name a few. He also started the Barbara E. Alexander Memorial Library and Health Clinic in Ghana as a part of the Leap for Ghana, an international literacy program he co-founded. He is the writer and executive producer of the crossover TV series on Disney, down right here in New Orleans. And this fall, we are expecting a new book, a part of one of a new trilogy, The Door of No Return. However, today we are most excited to be hosting the launch of his latest book, Book the graphic novel. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Brother Kwame Alexander. Thank you so much. Why y'all sitting way back there? <laughs> <laughs> Front and center. Front and center. So good to see everyone. Yes. Um, my name is Kwame. Thank you here for the wonderful introduction. Community Book Center has been around since 1983. That's, that's, that's like 39 years. That's 39 years, black owned bookstore. I grew up in black owned bookstores. Uh, my father was a book publisher and a, an author and a book distributor. So many of the bookstores that are no longer here and the bookstores that are here like Human Book Center I visited them as a child and I would talk to them on the phone because we distributed books to these stores. Um, when, I, when I was maybe 13 years old, my father said we were going to a place called London, England to sell books. So here was my job working for my father's company. My father would take his books to trade shows and he would set up books on a table and I would be responsible for selling the books. I would have to sell the books, so, which required me to, under, to know the books. So I'd have to read the books in order to be able to sell them. So I'd have books like, you may have heard of these books, uh, The Color Purple. <laughs> books like the African Writers series from Heinemann. Um, books like uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, books like uh, uh, Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery, a lot of books about Africa. And in order for me to sell these books, I had to know them. So here are the rules, 13 years old. You set the books up on the table, and when people come by, you cannot sit down. You have to stand up 
because people see you sitting down and they won't really, there's a point to this story, y'all. They're like, why is he telling us this story? There's a point. You couldn't sit down, you had to stand up and really work the table. You could not eat behind the table. If you ate behind my father's table while you were selling books, you were getting seriously fussed out in front of whomever was there. So I sold books a lot for my dad as a kid. So at age 13, he says, Kwame, we're going to London to sell books at the International Radical Book Fair of Black Book Publishers. And I'm like, yeah, it's going. I'm going to London. I'm going to hang. And so we fly on this airline called British Airways. My first time overseas. We fly first class. It's a double-decker plane. I'm chilling in first class, eating cashews and peanuts, ordering sparkling water, seltzer, having a good old time. They didn't even have movies back then on, on planes. It was in the 80s. I don't think they had movies. Um, but it was just real cool. So we get off the plane at Heathrow Airport, and this was when you had unlimited luggage. It was no one or two. It was unlimited with their reason. My dad went up to the reason line, y'all. We had 10 boxes of books, plus our luggage. So we had all the books we were selling. And a hand truck. So we get our, our boxes, and he says, all right, come on, get the books. So I get the hand truck, got the books. And we get to um, outside, and I'm like, cool, taxi. Black taxis? He's like, no, nah, we're taking the underground. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you, we literally just flew first class and now we're on the underground with 10 boxes of books? We took the underground to a place called Finsbury Park and it was, about, it was like a three hour ordeal. We get there, we check into the little hotel. Next day we go to the book fair. My dad's doing a panel or a workshop. I'm in charge of the books. So I got the books set up, I got them set up real nightly, nice like you taught me. I'm standing up behind the table, no food, people are coming up. What's this book? Well, this is a book called Things Fall Apart. It's written by Chenyu and Achebe. Um, I've read it three times, I'm talking about it. I'm talking about it. I'm talking about it. This is a book called 2000 Se Seasons by an author named Ayi Kwe Arma. I'm selling books, I'm selling books. And this woman comes up, I'm 13. And I said, she was, she was 14 when she wasn't like 30. <laughs> She's fine, right? And I, I write poetry. I write a lot of love poems at age 13. And so I'm talking to her, I'm sort of like blushing and crushing and having this conversation with her. And she was like, oh, this is a nice book. Turns out she's a college student. And uh, she's like, oh, I like this book. And I'm like, okay, you can have it. <laughs> and at the moment that I'm giving her the book, my dad is coming back from his panel discussion, and he sees me, and, uh, and she thanks me, and she keeps the book, and my dad just gives me this look, and I know I'm in trouble. He doesn't say anything else about it, and that was at age 13. And so for the next four years of my life, my life is filled with books and, and, and wanting to get as far away from literature and language as possible. And not wanting to have anything to do with books because I'm just sick of it. I love the travel part of it, but I'm sick of books. And so I go to a place called Virginia Tech and I study biochemistry because I'm going to be a pediatrician and I'm not going to have anything to do with, with books. And sophomore year, I take this class called Organic Chemistry. And I'm like, I think I'm going to change my major to English. <laughs> and then this really cool professor comes to Virginia Tech. His name is Nikki Giovanni. And she becomes a professor. I'm like, oh, I think I'm going to be a writer. This is going to be my full time job. And I remember writing poems in her class, love poems, still writing love poems, um, and getting C's on these poems and thinking, man, this poetry thing 
it may not work out if I'm getting C's. And I, I'm taking a class year after year and still getting C's and, and, and my degree is in English. And, and I graduate and go to work for my dad. I say, dad, I'm graduated now. I want to publish poetry. I want to work for your company and publish poets. And my dad says, poetry doesn't sell. You aren't going to make any money selling poetry. We, our company is not going to publish poetry. I'm like, I've been working for this company, for this family company, for my family's company, for all of my life. And you're telling me we can't publish this thing I want to publish? It's like, no, we aren't publishing it. And so about six months later, I quit. I'm not working for you anymore. I quit my father's company. And I decided to move from Virginia Beach, Virginia, to a place called Washington, D.C. And I'm a, I, I remember this. I'm leaving out of the door. My car is packed. And he comes outside and gives me a check for $1,700. And I said, what's this for? He said, use it how you need to use it. And so when I get to DC, I start a publishing company. And that $1,700 is going to pay for the first book we're going to publish, which is a book of my really bad love poem. <laughs> Lips like yours ought to be worshipped. See, I ain't never been too religious, but you can baptize me anytime. <laughs> I am not a painter. Browns and blues, we get along, but we are not close. I am no Van Gogh, but give me plain paper, a dull pencil, some scotch, and I will hijack your curves. Take your soul hostage, paint a portrait so colorful and delicate, you just may have to cut off my ear. <laughs> y'all can explain that to the kids when y'all get home. <laughs> so I published a book of my love poems. And with that money, I got a thousand copies of the book. And they're in my apartment, and they're, you know, I'm, I'm taking myself on a tour around America because I'm going to sell these thousand books. I'm going to be a poet. This is going to be my job one day. And I'm, you know, I'm 23 years old, and and uh, and I have temp jobs. I don't even have a full time job, and and I'm married at the time. And, and my wife comes home one day and she's, you know, we wake up one morning and my wife says, uh, I'll see you later, I'm going to work. And I say, okay. And I'm not going to work because I write poetry <laughs> and I'm in and out of jobs, temp jobs. It, it sounds funny, it wasn't funny then. <laughs> it's not even funny now when I think about it. Because she wakes up to go to work, Gabby, and, and the car is not there. And she's like, Kwame, what's up? Where's the car? And I'm like, it's, I parked it outside. And, and we go out there, and, and the car's been repossessed because I forgot to pay the bill. Because I, I didn't have the money. I had one job to do. Correct, I had one job. Pay the car note like $248. And I have a job I'm trying to be a poet and not understanding that first and foremost, you got to be able to take care of the things that you need in order to do the things that you want. I didn't get it at 23. And so now I'm on my own. I'm seeing my daughter every other weekend. And I got this book of really bad love poems and I'm traveling around the country trying to sell because this is my only source of revenue. And, and I go to Nashville and I, I speak to, to, to students in, at Fisk University and I go to uh, Raleigh Durham, and I, I speak to the Black Student Union at Duke University, and I'm selling five books here and ten books here, and, and I'm going around the country. And the, re the reason I'm traveling around the country to sell these books is because I read an article and published weekly that when Stephen King's Cujo came out, he got on a motorcycle and he drove to 30 cities. He rode to 30 cities and did a book tour. So I'm like, I'm putting myself on a book tour. I had no motorcycle. I had a friend with a broken down blue minivan, and we traveled. So we end up in a place called Los Angeles, California. I probably got 160 books. I'm broke. And I got this dream of being a writer. And I really want to figure out how to make a living from writing. I don't need to be rich. I just need to make a living from doing this thing that I love. And, and I'm at this church called Maranatha Community Church. 
And my friend goes there and she tells the pastor, whose name is Bam Beverly Crawford, that I am in, I'm here in Los Angeles to promote my book. And so at the end of the sermon, before the benediction, the pastor said, we have a poet named Kwame Alexander here. And I'm like, yes. We're gonna let him do a book signing in the gift shop. I'm like, yes. I'm feeling good. And she says, Kwame, will you come up? I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> And I come up to the pulpit and she says, would you like to share a poem from your, your, your book? And I say, yes. And it's a sea of beautiful black women in church hats. And I write suggestive love poems. <laughs> I have never been a slave, yet I know I am whipped. I have never been to Canada, yet I hope to cross your border. I have never traveled underground, yet the night knows my journey. If I were a poet in love, I'd say that with you. I have found that new place where romance is just a beginning and freedom is our end. And it's complete silence. <laughs> Until a woman in the back in the church head says, Hallelujah! <laughs> and I sell all 160 books. And this is the first moment in my life, this is September of 1995, where I say to myself, I think this writing career is going to work out. I think I can, I can at least get home and I can pay the rent for a couple months. I think this may work out. And over the next couple years, I write a couple books and I have about three or four more temp jobs. And, And I'm seeing my daughter every other weekend, and, and I write another book, and I got another job. I'm working at the Department of Housing and Urban Development in, in Washington, D.C., and my daughter turns 14. All of a sudden, I've been writing for 14 years, trying to make a living, and had 12 jobs, and it may not work out, but I'm loving what I'm doing. And my daughter comes home and says she, she's ready to start dating. We were on the patio and I was grilling. And she said, Dad, I met this boy and I like him. And I'm going to go out on a date with him. I'm like, you are not. <laughs> In your 30s, you can date. <laughs> and so I write a poem. Because it's the thing I do when I'm trying to understand the woes of the world. 10 Reasons Why Fathers Cry at Night. One, because 15-year-olds don't like park swings or long walks anymore unless you're in the mall. Two, because holding her hand is forbidden and kisses are lethal. Three, because school was fine, her day was fine, and yes, she's fine, so why is she weeping? Four, because you want to help, but you can't read minds. Five, because she's in love and that's cute until you find his note asking her to prove it. Six, because she didn't prove it. Seven, because next week she's in love again, and this time it's real, she says her heart is heavy. Eight, because she yearns to take long walks in the park with him. Nine, because you remember the myriad woes and wonders of spring desire. And ten, because with trepidation and thrill, you watch your teenage daughter who suddenly wants to swing all by herself. And so I slide the poem under her door. She comes in my room crying the next day. She said, Dad, this poem is my Bible. Thank you for writing it. But I'm still going on a date. <laughs> So I end up writing a couple more books, and by now I've written 11 books, and, and I'm feeling like uh, I'm getting really good at this writing thing, and I'm on job maybe number 16, and I have another daughter. And now she's one year old, and I'm at home because my wife is working. She has the job, it has the insurance, and I'm still trying to be this poet, this writer. And I've, I've been laid off from a job. And so I'm at home with the one-year-old and she's crying. I'm trying to get her to stop crying and I don't know what to do. And so I put on some Ella Fitzgerald. And she stopped crying. So then I put on some, uh, some Sarah Vaughn. And I put on some Billie Holiday and the kid's not crying. I'm like, this is it. And so I'm like, well, if I'm gonna introduce her to jazz music. I should tell her what jazz music is, and so I write a book. 
about jazz music for my daughter. And it's called Acoustic Rooster and His Barnyard Band. And it, and it goes like this. Can you bring me a copy of Acoustic Rooster and maybe a couple of other books as well? Acoustic Rooster sat outside strumming his bass guitar. He practiced jazz all summer long so he could be a... Now every year about this time, Farmer announced his plan to hold a barnyard talent show and find the farmer's best. Acoustic Rooster asked to join Thelonious Monkey's crew, but Farmer's rule prevented that because they lived at the... Mules Davis led an orchestra. That's pretty genius, isn't it? <laughs> so I write this book, and I am, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty cool book, and I'm going to publish it myself, because up until now, I've published all of my books, and I haven't really made a whole lot of money, but it's never been about the money. And so I'm speaking at a conference in Florida, and it's English teachers. And they pay me $25 to come and speak. I was like, yes, I'll do it. And, and so I finished speaking and the organizer was in the back of the room. She's like, great, you were great. You should come to um, the luncheon and speak. We have three other authors. I said, sure. So I go to the luncheon and there are three other authors. And one of the authors, and I, I don't write children's books, really. I read love poems for the most part. And the other authors they have, thank you. One of them is, a man by the name of Mo Willems, who is probably the most successful children's picture book author ever. Don't let the pigeon drive the elephant in. Yeah, so Mo Willems is the guy. So he, so the, 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 the teachers, the Florida teachers are in love with Mo Willems, so he rocks the house and they're just, yes, and then they ask me to come up and I'm like, well, what am I gonna do for these elementary school teachers? And of course, I'm going to read a love poem, <laughs> right? Um, and so I read a love poem. Wow. I think it's something like, a, if I am your heart, I think I start off with this. If I am your heart, if I am your heart, think of me inside. Beating, pumping, loving. <laughs> Who does that? So I'm, just, I'm reading a series of haiku, right? These love poems. And so the teachers are like laughing and rubbing their heads. And they're like, more, more. And I end up reading love poems for about 30 minutes. And I sell all the books. And so these other children were calling them looking at me like, who is this guy? How did he do that? And a guy comes up to me, one of the other authors, and he says, Kwame, you should really write for kids. You have a voice, you should write for children. You should call my editor. On that Monday, I call this editor. She says, have you ever written for children? I say, that's all I do. <laughs> she says, do you have any manuscript? I say, yes, I've got a manuscript about a rooster who started the jazz band with Doug Ellington and Neil Davis. She says, send it to me. I send it to her. About nine days later, she says, Kwame, we'd like to publish it. So now I'm thinking, book number 13, I'm about to be rich. It's going down. I won't have to look for a job again. My wife is gonna be happy and satisfied. And then I get the contract and it's for enough money to be able to pay the mortgage for maybe three months. So I'm not going to be rich, but I'm going to have a book deal. The book comes out, it starts doing well, um, but not well enough for me not to look for a job. And so I'm working um, at a government contracting company in a place called Reston, Virginia for about two years. And then I get laid off and I am selling books behind a table in a place called New York City selling copies of this acoustic rooster book and some of my other books and this woman comes up to me and she says Kwame you sh should really write a novel for kids I've heard your poetry you have a voice have you ever thought about doing this and of course I said yes I have <laughs> that's all I think about <laughs>
And so she says, well, she works for one of the biggest publishing companies ever. And she says, if you have something you'd like to submit to me, send it to me. I'm thinking, this is it. This is book number 14. This is the one. It's going to be published. It's going to do everything I need it to do, which is allow me to provide for my family in a way that I don't have to stress. I write the book. I spend every day in Panera Bread during the summer, and I write the book. And it's about 60 pages long. And it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's a great book. It's my 14th book. It's a novel, but it's told in poems. And I know poetry like the back of my hand by now. And I send this book to this publisher, and she tells me that it's not that good. And I ask her, what's wrong with it? And she, she can't tell me. Not that she won't tell me, she can't articulate what's wrong with it, just that it doesn't work. So she says, go back and take another stab at it. So I write, rewrite it, and now it's about 100 pages long. And I send it back to her. And she says, Kwame, let's have a phone conference. And we talk on the phone, and she says, it's still got some issues that you need to work through. And she's real vague about what some of those issues are. She gives me a few things. And so I go back and I rewrite it another time. And now it's about 200 pages long. And I'm feeling like this is the best thing I've ever written. And by now, it's been about three years, this entire process. And I send it back to her. And she says, this is just never going to work. You're writing a novel. And you're writing it in poetry. But your poetry isn't really working. And boys aren't going to want to read it. And your novel is about basketball. And girls aren't going to want to read a book about basketball now that I think about it. So I go back and I rewrite it another time. And now it's about 238 pages. And it's the best thing I've ever written. I feel so good about this book. And I send it to 18 publishers and all 18 publishers. I still have the emails to this day tell me all the reasons why this book will never work. And so it's, it's, it's four years. And I don't understand why nobody likes this book about these two boys who are twins, one who has long locks and the other one who has no hair. And one day, the brother with no hair bets his twin that he's going to make the last shot in the game. And if he does, he gets to cut off all of his brother's hair. And the brother with locks responds, if my hair were a tree, I'd climb it. I'd kneel down beneath and enshrine it. I treat it like gold and then mine it. Each day before school, I unwind it. And right before games, I entwine it. These locks on my head, I designed it. And one last thing, if you don't mind it, that bet you just made, I decline it. I was like, this is, this is fire. What are you talking about? <laughs> and so I hire a writing coach. This is my last resort. I hire a writing coach. I, she, she charges me $800 to read my manuscript and give me notes. And she gives me about 50 pages of notes. And I go back and I rewrite the book again. And I get, I get the biggest agent in New York who's going to represent me and help me sell this book. And I'm thinking, this is it. It's five years into this writing of this novel. This is 22 years into my writing career. This is the moment. This is 21 jobs later. This is it. This is finally the chance where I'm going to be able to be a full-time writer. And I get the biggest agent in New York. And after three months of working with this agent, he says, Kwame, we got another rejection. After five months, we got two more rejections. After about a year and a half, we got like 11 more rejections. And so, but I haven't read any rejections. So I take the Amtrak to New York City from DC and I, I go to his office and I'm like, yo, help me figure this out. Why is no one interested in this novel? What did the rejection say? And he says, he looks me dead in the eye and he says, Kwame, I never submitted your book. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, Kwame, you wrote a poetry book. You don't want that to define who you are as a writer. 
And so I looked at him and I said, dude, I love you because he was a good friend by now, but you're fired. Because you can never have anybody around you who thinks less of your, who thinks less of you than you do, who doesn't lift you up, who doesn't have as much, if not more, ambition for you in your career than you do. I don't believe in having no people around you. You got to have yes people around you. And so I fired him. And I thought maybe this book isn't going to ever be published. And I decided to publish it myself. And a week later, I got an email from this woman in a place called Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And she said, call me. My name is Margaret Raymo. I read your novel. Everybody on my team read it. And we loved it. This is good. And she says, we, we want to publish it and we're going to make you an offer. And I'm thinking, oh, snap, I'm about to be rich. <laughs> and then I get the contract and I'm like, no, I'm not going to be rich. But the book is published in, in March of 2014, March the 8th. And I'm feeling great. Finally, after six years, the book got published. And a funny thing happens. Boys start reading the book because they see this, this kid playing basketball on the cover, so the boys are reading it. And, and the girls start reading it because they're like, what's this book all the boys are reading? And then the librarians and the teachers and the parents start reading it because they're like, what's this book all the kids are reading that we don't know about? And everybody's reading this book. And there's just like ground, groundswell of like love and for the book. And, and then this teacher in Dallas, Texas, she she posts on, on Twitter that she has to lock up her copies of the book because the boys are stealing the book from the library, reading it, and then raffling the book off to girls to read. And I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and, and then on, on social media, um, social media has, uh, there's this award called the Newberry Medal. It's an award for the, the best children's book in America. So on social media during 2014, teachers and librarians start posting and tweeting, yo, this book, The Crossover, has a great chance of winning a Newberry. And so I'm like, this is interesting, because it's, ju it's juxtaposed against the first review I ever read of the book once it was published. It was a review on Amazon, and the review had two words, and it simply said, this sucks. That was the first review. So, but now there's like this, this buzz that this book could win some awards. So I'm like, it's interesting. And, you know, I'm starting to like read all this stuff. And now it's starting to get in my head. Oh, snap, do I have a chance? Is it possible? And, you know, with these awards, you're not supposed to talk about it. Like, you don't want to jinx it. And then you're not supposed to talk about it because it's like, you really think you got a chance at this? And a really good friend of mine, her name is Jacqueline Woodson, she, she wrote a book called Brown Girl Dreaming. And everybody, including me, thought that book was the one. That was the best book. And so maybe a, the award is announced in January. And so maybe around October, I started saying to myself, yeah, we got a real good shot of getting maybe second or third place. And I knew that if I had a chance of winning this, thank you all for coming. We're almost done, but it's okay. <laughs> I know them. That's why I can tell them. I know them. <laughs> Um, so I say to myself, Kwame, you're probably not going to win this. And you didn't write the book to win it. You wrote it. The, the reward is for young people to be reading. So you're probably not going to win it. But you do have an ego. And so when you don't win, you are, gonna, you're, you are going to be unable to write for a while because you're going to be too disappointed. That's just the truth. I said that to myself, and so I began writing another book. And I said, I'm going to finish this book the day before they announce 
the Newbury Award because I know when I don't win, I won't be able to write after that day and I have a book deal. And so I wrote a book called Booked. I wrote a book about a soccer player, um, a 12 year old boy who's dealing with divorce. You got it, right there, right. Um, about a 12 year old boy who's dealing with divorce and, and, and he loves soccer or as we call it in, in Britain, football. Um, and and he, his father is a um, logophile. His father writes dictionaries of like weird and wonderful words. And his father makes him read the dictionary. All the things my dad did to me. This is not an autobiography though, y'all. Um, Why couldn't your dad be a musician like Jimmy Leon's dad or own an oil company like Kobe's? Better yet, why couldn't he be a cool detective driving a sleek silver convertible car like Will Smith and Bad Boys? Instead, your dad's a linguistics professor with chronic verbal mania as evidenced by the fact that he actually wrote a dictionary called Weird and Wonderful Words with, get this, footnotes. <laughs> In the elementary school spelling bee, when you intentionally misspelled heifer, he almost had a cow. <laughs> That's the best line ever. You're the only kid on your block at school in the entire freaking world who lives in a prison of words. He calls it the pursuit of excellence. You call it Shawshank. And even though your mother forbids you to say it, the truth is you hate words. It's about a 12 year old boy who knows the dictionary and he hates words and it's called Booked. Does anyone know why it's called Booked? Any students? Raise your hand if you know why I called it Booked. Anybody play soccer? What is it called when you get a yellow card or a red card? It's called getting what? It's called getting a penalty. What's, another, what's, what's one word? What's, what's, what's another way of saying it? He got booked. So I called it book, right? right. So um, I finished the book on February the 1st, 2015, about 10 minutes after the Seahawks threw the ball instead of ran it into the end zone. <laughs> But yeah, like, why did I give my son lose the ball? I finished the book 10 minutes after watching the Seahawks lose the Super Bowl. And then I went home because I was at my friend's house. And this is 23 years of being a writer, and this is book number 14. And I go home, and I get home by like 12.30, and I'm sitting in my basement. And I start watching The Walking Dead. And then I just get thirsty, so I drink a root beer, and and then I, I actually get hungry, and I make some pancakes, and now it's like 4 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> and I'm just up. And then about 6 a.m., no, no, before that, I turn off the TV, and I start reading the crossover. I'm reading the novel, and I find this error in the book that's still in there to this day, Marcus. <laughs> I will not, don't ask me where it is. I'm not telling you. And I find this error in the book and I'm freaking out. What? How is that there? And then about 6 a.m., I go upstairs and I get in the bed. And I pass out. I'm exhausted in it. And then at 7 16 a.m., my phone rings. And it wakes me up. And I look at it and it says no caller ID. And I answer the phone and the caller says, is this Kwame Alexander? And I say, yes. And he says, Kwame, I'm calling from the Newberry Committee. And I say, oh snap. <laughs> and he says, I'm calling to tell you that your novel, The Crossover, and all I can think is this is gonna be a really good call. And he says, I'm calling to tell you that your novel, The Crossover, and all I could think was, 
there's no way I'm getting this call if I had just given up after any or all of those rejections. And he says, I'm calling to tell you that your novel, The Crossover, is the winner of the Newbery Medal for the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. And I hear nothing else he says. And I just start dancing. I just start dancing and screaming around the room. And my six year old comes in the room. She's like, Why are you dancing and screaming? I'm like, I just want to meet her. And she's like, Great. Can you make me some French toast? <laughs> And so my philosophy on life is that the no's are a part of life. We're all going to be told no. And the deal is you learn to embrace the no's, accept them. And you keep saying yes to yourself. Because the thing about all the no's is once they are finished partying with you all night, they got to go home at some point. They can't stay in the club all night, Leslie. <laughs> they gotta go home, and when they go home, there's only one thing left at the party. It's the yes. But are you willing to sort of wait and work? Dribble, fake, shoot, miss. Dribble, fake, shoot, miss. Dribble, fake, shoot, miss. Dribble, fake, shoot, swish. But you gotta keep shooting. There's no way I would have ever kept shooting had I not been raised in a household with a man and a woman who understood the value and the power of words and how they can transform our lives and how they can build confidence and how they can allow us to find our voices. That's why I write. That's why I write. That's why I love my job. That was a long story. I appreciate you all listening to it. Um, that's sort of how, that's a little bit of how booked happened and a lot of how I happened. Um, but yeah, we got a lot of students here and I'm sure some of you may have some questions. So before I sign a lot of books, because I'm sure y'all gonna buy a lot of books, um, I'd love to answer some questions. Yes. Um, What's your name? My name is Joyce. Joy? Joyce. Joyce. How you doing, Joyce? I want to know when you guys made your big piece of life. Meaning to get a lot of life in life, so we can focus on the past a little bit. And um, how difficult was it for you as a nice male father to break into the music that I'm doing? That's a great question. How difficult was it for me as a black male author? Yeah. I'm asking you because in my teaching, and the school system, I was in, it was so difficult to find the books for the boy, and it wasn't written by a black man. You know what I'm saying? It's like racist, you know what I mean? But I'm not a so here's what so there's this thing in America called racism, right? Right. And it it has a tendency to try to distract you from being who you are supposed to be. It it thinks it has the power to to define you for you. I I have I choose not to allow that to define me. So if a publisher is saying, I don't think your book is of value, it's of worth, these stories about these boys matter, that doesn't stop me because I, I'm gonna publish it myself. You know what I'm saying? So we ask the question how difficult. It has never been difficult for me to move through this world and be who I need to be because I don't allow other people to lower my goals by their limited expectations 
of who they think I need to be. So it's never been difficult. It took me, you know, um, it took me 23 years to get a book, thank you, to get a book published in a way that let y'all know who I was. So if you're talking about that process, that took 23 years. But I always knew who I was. I was never, you know, I always knew who I was. Yeah, everybody, the, the people who have the problem can't, can't dictate your, your success. That's their issue. So that is not to say it is not challenging for a black person to get a show on the air in Hollywood, or it is not challenging for a black writer to get a book deal, or it is not challenging for a black person to um, get a house appraised at the value that it should be appraised at. That is not to say that these things are challenging. It is not to say that. It is only to say that I will not be defined by those things. That answers your question. Yes. What is your name? Leslie, Leslie what? Thank you. <laughs> That's my sister. Leslie. Can you help me? <laughs> you got your body good? Okay. Um, the question is, yeah, yeah. the question was, how do I stay connected with the young people? Right? So, um, let's, let's have a couple young people. So this young man right here, come on up. Yeah, yeah, come on up. Yeah. And you as well, come on, come on up. Both of you. And then right here, right here, in the mask. Yes, yes, come on up. Come on. All right, so um, tell me your name and what grade you're in. I'm Jamal Smith, and I'm in sixth grade. I'm Miss Lillian, and I'm in fourth grade. Joseph Hugo, and I'm in seventh grade. All right, cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you. So, have y'all read any of my books? You read the crossover? What do you think about it? On a scale of one to ten, what would you give it? <laughs> <laughs> what is your mom? You can have a talk. Have you read either? You read both? What do you think? Okay, cool. What are you ready? Get ready. I'll see you here just to see what's what. That's what's up. <laughs> All right, so look, um, I'm going to recite a poem, right? But I'm going to leave five words open. So, whoever fills in the most words gets a prize. All right, y'all ready? You just gotta call it out if you know it. Y'all can't say the answer. Okay. All right, here we go. <clears throat> if I had the right shoes, Charlie Bell would never lose. Air Jordan 3s would be my muse, and these kicks would be old shoes. News, right here. Very good, very good. I'd skate the sky and you couldn't keep up, so don't even try. Why? Because my feet got wings like a butter. Fly. Fly. All three of y'all got it. Very good. Very good. Y'all have to fly up to each one. So. <laughs> Two points, one point, one point. Here we go. Because my feet got wings like a butterfly. I'd steal the ball and make you. 
I steal the ball and make you. Because my feet got wings. Because my feet got wings like a butterfly. I steal the ball and make you. I steal the ball and make you. Right. All right, last one, last one. Here we go, here we go. I steal the ball and make you cry. My game is so criminal, I need an alibi. Woo! Give it up, y'all. Alibi. Yeah. Um, it's that right there that keeps me excited and inspired to keep writing because I know what kind of impact the words, the books, can have on young people, how it can engage them in this sort of imaginative life. I stay connected because I just love interacting with young people, you know? I, I still feel like I'm a kid, and I know I probably act like I'm a kid too, but I just feel that, you know? So I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yes. What's your name? So what are the marketing strategies that I use for the self-publishing books? Um, so when I wrote this book, Acoustic Rooster, I, uh, y'all ever been to farmer's markets? Yeah. Right? So I would go to farmer's markets with this book. I have 100 copies of the book, and I'd have them set up on a table in the way that my dad showed me how to set <laughs> books up, right? And so I'd buy a table at a farmer's market, be from 9 a.m. to noon, have 100 copies of the book set up. Nobody else was selling books at a farmer's market because they were selling produce, candles, alpaca sweaters. <laughs> like nobody had books, right? Right? So I had books. And people would come by, you know, pushing strollers with their kids, and I would be reciting the book, and I'd have a T-shirt on that said "Got Research," and I have jazz music playing in the background, and I have a bale of hay on the table, and I would sell all hundred books every time I went out. Um, I tried to use a lot of the same strategies that I used my entire career. Um, so, so that was one of the things, but I just believe you have to be able to put yourself out there. You have to be um, able to sort of present on the stage as well as on the page. I think it's important if you want to, you know, if you want to sell books. Yeah. Yeah, I think the last thing I'll share with you all is that um, book number 37 comes out on September the 27th, and it is a... Um, It is a. Uh, it was the hardest book I wrote during the pandemic in London, um, and it's about a boy who's twelve years old who has a crush on a girl, um, and who also has a cousin who likes the same girl, and his cousin is a bully, and his cousin beats him at everything, at racing and wrestling, and one day he decides he's going to best his cousin finally because he's a good swimmer. So he's going to challenge his cousin to a swim off. So every day he goes down to the river to swim, to practice swimming. And, and he's getting good. He's fast. And he knows that if he beats his cousin, he's going to win the heart of this girl. And the night before the big swim off, he goes down to the river to get one more fight. He always been by the in his community to stay out of the river. And so he goes to the river and he swims fast, excited. And he comes back, he comes out of the river. And I can't tell y'all what happens yet. <laughs> but it's, it's called The Door of No Return. And it comes out on September the 27th. It has been such an honor to be able to be at this bookstore 
that I visited as a child that I've heard so much about that I remember um, knowing and learning about as a child. I'm just grateful, I'm grateful for you all uh, for coming out this afternoon. It's been pretty late. Um, I can't uh, crewmates from the Crossover TV series on Disney Plus who have got to support. Thank you all. For hosting me, uh, this has been an honor, and I look forward to signing you. Thank you. Let's do it up for Brother Kwame. Yeah. As I said before, we are really excited to have had this opportunity to host this event. And we are looking forward to being selected to have the event for the Door of No Return. Because on September the 20th, Seventh, when it comes out, the very next day, September the 28th, is Community Book Center's 39th anniversary. another way to kick off our 40th year celebration than to host a book launch for the door of no return. So y'all stay tuned for that and be sure to tell others about it. Again, I want to thank you all for coming out this evening um, and sharing this special occasion with us. I also would like to thank all of the people who have joined in with us on our Crowdcast and our Facebook platform, those who could not be here, but personally, but who are joining us virtually. We do have copies of the books available and um, Brother Kwame will sign them for you. Um, today is also a very, very, um, oh, yeah. Um, I just want to, Brother Kwame, could you come up please? Y'all was hanging out, huh? Y'all was hanging out, huh? Well, I just would like for all of you all to join me in celebrating and wishing Brother Kwame a very happy birthday. Sign them. 
So again, thank you again for um, coming out. We have the books um, out in the lobby. Uh, before we leave, I would like to thank um, the Andre Caillou Center for Social Justice and Arts who have um, partnered with us to uh, have the space available for us to have events that we could not hold in the book center. And we also want to give a shout out to No Dream Deferred um, also for their continued support. And we encourage you to come back um, to this space where um, beginning this fall, we're going to have lots of programming of all types of cultural arts types of um, programming. I know that uh, Urban Bushwoman is doing some um, work here. And we're just looking forward to local, national, and international acts being right here on this stage. Again, thank you for um, your support. And thank you for being here. You have a question or comment? No, the comment is in the lobby right outside. Thank you. Thank you.